Hey, this is Nicole. I'm here just to recap the critical edge and key elements to take away from the lecture I just did. So we're going to talk about pacing, cardioversion, and defibrillation. So key things for pacing. Again, we do this for patients who are unstable uh, with different bradycardias. Um, a lot of times we'll, we'll, use pay, we'll divert to pacing when um, atropine or other me measures have failed. Key elements, you've got to have the defib pads on the patient. You also need to have the ECG leads on. The ECG leads are critical for pacing because those ECG leads identify the underlying rhythm and the defib pads turn into your pacer. Um, so again, you remember you have to use a decent amount of energy because you have to pace through skin, fat, bone, tissue. So start low and, and bring the patient up, um, bring the milliamperage up to successfully pace. Once you see a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS, it's going to be key to also assess not just for electrical capture, but mechanical capture. Meaning if I've got capture on my ECG, do I have a pulse in that patient as well? And then of course, always reassessing the patient's blood pressure. Um, kind of default, quick default uh, pad placement is anterior lateral, uh, but a lot of uh, providers like to go anterior posterior as well. So, um, I, you know, there's a lot of that goes into that decision making, but when it's emergent, this is easy. If you've got time, AP, a lot of times is preferred. Okay, so that's the, the low down with pacing. Now, cardioversion, we do, we cardiovert, when patients have an unstable tachycardia. So our key things, we're gonna try vagal first, then we can try meds. So we can try things like adenosine or even uh, like a calcium channel blocker like diltiazem. But the key thing is if the patient gets very unstable, uh, we're gonna go to cardioversion. Couple of things about cardioversion, the sync button has to be pressed on your defibrillator. So you want a marker on every single QRS, and that is in the cardiac cycle to which the energy will be delivered. If that button is not pressed and energy is delivered, you can inadvertently put the patient into ventricular tachycardia and now lead them to a pulseless situation. That's not what we want to do. Every, cardioversion, the key things about cardioversion is the prep. You've got to prep these patients. So you need to make sure you've got emergency supplies at the bedside, make sure they've gotten some sort of a sedative, ideally with some amnesic effect, and uh, make sure you've got oxygen, suction, your crash cart um, in the patient's room. And usually we'll start with lower energy. Lower can mean anything from 50 joules um, up to 200 joules. It depends on the rhythm and the patient. But with uh, successive cardioversions, you want to um, increase the energy that you're using to cardiovert. And then always be prepared if the patient goes into V-fib to D-fib. All right, last thing is defibrillation. So with defibrillation, uh, you're going to start usually with anywhere from 120, 150, 200 joules, depends um, on which defibrillator you're using. But again, we usually go anterior lateral as initial pad placement, but you can go anterior posterior uh, pretty quickly um, if you can. Couple things about defibrillation that are key is make sure you are doing chest compressions anytime you are not act actively defibrillating. And that is absolutely key. Get on the chest, stay on the chest doing chest compressions in between defibrillation. Um, but when you defib, uh, you wanna make sure everyone's clear of not touching the patient defibrillate, and then immediately get back on the patient's chest. So those would be the kind of the key things to understand. And then with um, successive defibrillations, you want to escalate your energy. And every manufacturer of defibrillators has different energy recommendations. So just know your equipment and know what the energy levels that are commonly used at your hospital.